in a rather large, I just looked at the food out there, um, that's a major intake of carbs. Um, you're now going to descend into a carb stupor, and it's my job to keep you awake. Um, so um, we, shall, we shall do this with uh, gratuitous imagery, um, references to all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the talk, uh, Get Carter. Um, I am not Michael Caine. For those of you that do not know, uh, it's a 1971 film. Uh, it's kind of classic London gangster um, uh, movie. Um, you know, Michael Caine wandering around with a shotgun in Newcastle, goes up to Newcastle on a kind of like vengeance quest. Uh, there was a 2000 remake with Sylvester Stallone. We do not speak of this. <laughs> okay. Um, the same goes for the 1995 Sylvester Stallone Judge Dredd. We certainly don't speak of that. Uh, if you want the real version, you uh, see the Carl Urban version a couple of years back. Um, so, anyway, uh, yes, this is the title. Well, actually, this is the title. I'm not, I don't have a picture of me with a shotgun, so you just get my Twitter handle. Um, and uh, there is the question, which came first, the title or the content of the talk? Well, the title, obviously. You know, you sit there and you have an idle moment and you think, damn, that would be good. What talk could I give to that title? Um, and so there is, this, uh, there is this kind of interesting question. Uh, we have, uh, within the craftsmanship community, this idea of Carter's, and there are, uh, there are lots of discussions about the correct way to pronounce it. Um, I do not speak Japanese, and certainly there's a lot of variation within uh, Japanese pronunciation, but rummaging around the great sink of all human knowledge, um, the internet, uh, we can see that actually, is it kata or kata? Some people really go for kata. As far as I can get, as far as I can figure it out, it's closer to kata, which justifies the title of this talk. Um, so, uh, if you care about it, the um, uh, the katakana is uh, written like that. If you can read katakana, well done. Uh, it has two kanji forms um, because why make things simple? Uh, but let's talk about the translation because it has a very narrow meaning in uh, the way that it has been adopted. Originally uh, introduced by uh, Dave Thomas, and I do recall the discussion. I remember I was much more, much keener on the idea of referring to these practice exercises of improving your skills uh, more as etudes. So in other words, something a little more um, musical, uh, which suggested exploration. Um, the term Carter is, uh, from a typical point of view, is taken from uh, martial arts and is a repetition exercise. But the word itself actually has uh, deeper resonance, and I think we should tap that deeper resonance. Um, so there's this idea of form, there's this idea of um, structure, um, there's this idea of pattern, which certainly appeals to me as a kind of long standing member of the patterns community. Um, there's this question of style, and uh, style is a manner of expression, it's sort of an articulation of form. And then there is the term that people tend to anchor on, which is training exercise. Um, and I would like to embrace all of these to sort of offer us a slightly larger um, view of uh, what we mean by Carter's, as well as a bit of fun. Um, so I'll sort of start off with um, this book that was uh, published, um, oh God, seven years ago, and there are some people who contributed to it uh, amongst the speakers in the audience. 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. Uh, and in this uh, collection, of advice. There was a rather nice piece from uh, John Jagger, um, who's the author of the Cyber Dojo uh, uh, environment, uh, which is a wonderful environment for practicing um, TDD in groups. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, and he focused on deliberate practice, which is where people normally anchor themselves when they're thinking about this idea of Carter's to improve your practice. Um, take something and practice it again. Don't just do it once. In software development, we normally do things once. Yeah, the first time you ever see something, eventually you understand it. And guess what? That's the last you ever see of it. You've just figured it out. And oh, so there's this idea. But this doesn't happen in, in many other disciplines. Uh, you know, if we talk about musical, um, musical instruments, at the moment, I, uh, uh, my older boy is uh, learning the drums. Uh, my younger one's learning the bass. And I've just picked up the guitar again. And we don't just play something once and then leave it. It's like, yeah, that worked. We're done. Ship it. It doesn't work like that. You go back and you do it again. And then you explore variations. You try and get it either note perfect or actually what we do an awful lot of is jamming. Um, so let's try alternatives. So within a well-structured framework, that gives you, a, as it were, a baseline to experiment and explore. 
so there is this idea of deliberate practice to improve your ability to perform a task. So skill and technique. There's this repetition. And importantly, the distinction from daily work is you do deliberate practice to master the task, not to complete the task. Everything else is about getting to done. And done is about some concept of completion. What we're after here is some kind of mastery. And that is not, that doesn't have an easy definition of done. If you ask anybody um, who is on the road to mastery of any kind, whether it is musical, whether it is coding, whether it is sports, again, another discipline in which practice is considered to be uh, kind of important. You know, Usain Bolt, 10 seconds, on the, 10 seconds on the track. What does he do the rest of the day? Yeah? So um, the point there is that there is this idea of mastery in and around to get good at something. And what is software? Software is software is applied thought. So therefore, the thing ultimately you want to get good at is not re blind repetition. You want to get good at thinking. And it turns out um, to my favorite piece of life advice um, from Emile Auguste Chartier, there is nothing more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. OK? And you feel free to sort of go around and beat people with this as a reminder. We anchor two quickly on certain ideas, the right way of doing something, uh, whether it is at the large scale, uh, the organization, or whether it is a particular way of coding. Um, and when people do paradigm hopping, I tend to find that it's just like there's a danger that you get locked into the new paradigm with the same passion that you were locked into the old paradigm with. You haven't really done anything new in one sense. You've just transferred your stuck mindset from one place to another. The whole point here is to learn to think and to kick the tires of these ideas. Now, we can see that this is not simply something that we see in code or in these other disciplines I've referred to. Um, for reasons that are, I, I have no idea why I got into this one, um, last, last year, around this time last year, I started getting interested in um, different proofs of um, Pythagoras, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. So given a, b, c, then we know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And you, you know, the beautiful visualization, you draw squares on it, and you show it to your children, and you go, this is awesome. And they go, yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> Fortunately, I actually have kids that can be engaged. And this question is like, well, what are the practical upshots of this? And how do you prove this? And I was taught a particular proof at school that I kind of forgotten. And I remember it, was, it seemed fairly well, indirect. I thought there must be simpler ways. And th then it occurred to me one day, it's like, wait a minute. Look at this notation. Look at this notation. This notation is new. It's only a, it's only a few centuries old. What the hell did Pythagoras do? What, what was he doing? He didn't do this. He didn't do algebraic proofs of any kind. So what did he do? We taught these various ways. So it turns out that he had a very different approach. It's like, OK, we're going to take this. We're going to take this. We're going to take that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange things. And then we're going to do that. And then we're going to, make a, uh, we're going to draw a conclusion about the areas of the squares. This is known as a proof by rearrangement. It, uh, you can do it with bits of paper. And this is, this is wonderfully elegant. Of course, I was not taught that at school, because that's too obvious. Why teach your kids things that are obvious and simple? Um, we were taught far more complex approaches. And then there was another one, which I, I, my favorite algebraic proof, yes, you can have favorite algebraic proofs. Um, uh, is this one? It's just like okay, well, let's do that. Let's let's measure up the let's measure up the rectangles, uh, the, sorry, the uh, the triangles. We get that, and then with the whole one, it must be by definition a plus b on each side. So therefore, this must be equal to that. Eliminate some terms. Boom! It's just like again, very simple. I managed to get my, uh, as he was then, my ten-year-old to appreciate this, and I thought, okay, we're doing something right here. And then, so we've got two ways of doing this. It turns out there's lots of ways. Einstein had his own proof by rearrangement. Uh, there's the crazy thing I did at school. It turns out there's about 400 different ways of doing this. It's kind of a rite of passage. In fact, President Garfield, the 20th president of the United States of America, who lasted only six months uh, because he was shot, um, probably for being smart, um, came up with a proof. I'd like to put that in context. President number 45. Okay, <laughs> Just imagine President number 45 coming up with well, actually, a coherent sentence. Um, <laughs> so 
President Garfield, a, a former president of the United States of America, in the, in the 1870s, before he became, he was actually a senator at the time, he published a, an original proof, the trape trapezoid proof. And it's just like, this is insanely elegant. It's just like, this is really simple. And it's just like, yeah, we've got more than one way to think about this. And it works out beautifully. So, you can keep doing this. I'm not going to go and show you the other 400 proofs. Um, yeah, for a start, I don't know them, and some of them are profoundly esoteric. So we really need to apply this idea of um, thinking outside the triangle um, with something that's a little more industrial strength and more code-focused. And of course, we know that there's only one Carter that will fulfill this. Um, so you know, there is only one way that we're going to do this. So we're going to explore Fizzbug. Now, what do we do with this? Well, sometimes it's used as an interview question. We often use it as a carter to kind of get into a programming language to get into. So this is very useful. Again, if there is a language you don't know, but you know the shape of the problem, then OK, let's just try that. Because I'm familiar with something, the problem. I'm just unfamiliar with the language. So I've got something, I've got something I can sort of hold on to that I feel secure in. OK, that's great. But then there's the other aspect. What other skills do I want to pick up? And this is normally used in the context of um, learning TDD, get people to write good unit tests. So, okay, let's, let's start them out with some Java, and then they go ahead and they write Fizzbuzz tests, class, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've got all my tests in test Fizzbuzz. And you say, you know, you might want to kind of, you might want a more meaningful name there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and don't, obviously don't pursue this line too long, because otherwise you will end up with test Fizzbuzzes working correctly as expected. Yeah, if people just add words, but reduce the meaning. OK, so then people start off down, it's down, down the path of like, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to fizz buzz of one is one. See, I'm using a proper statement here. Um, I'm, I'm, I, you know, if you feel comfortable putting the word should in there, you go for it, whatever makes you feel good. But it's not should be one. Really, it is one. Otherwise, it's wrong. Yeah, we don't, we don't have kind of like, it's not red and a little, it's not, it's not a case of sort of green and a little bit reddish green. It really is red. You know, it's kind of like, actually, you know what? It's not working. It's, there's no should about it. Uh, that do or do not, there is no should. So we end up with people doing this stuff, and then they do this. Fizz buzz of two is two, and then fizz buzz of three is fizz. And this is a fine way to start, but then they continue in this vein, and you end up with all of this. It's just, oh, dear God. No, all right, let's just not look at that. Let's, let's see if we can... We don't want to repeat the same bad idea. We want to... Deliberate practice is not simply about, here's the first idea I thought of, I'm going to keep doing. It is about improvement. So let's go and look at the code. And you, then you've got the problem. And what is the problem? There is the sense of, I'm going to do this one right. I'm going to apply all the skills that I've learnt in enterprise coding. And so you end up with Fizzbuzz Calculator. <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is going to get painful. Um, so if you, ever, if you ever kind of want to understand the inner credo of many programmers, it's captured by Poole Anderson, science fiction author by Anderson's Law. I've yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when you looked at it in the right way, did not become still more complicated. You know, you often have people going like, yeah, I see that request that you've got, that feature request, and yeah, that would be quite easy to do, but I can make it much more interesting. And there's a technology I've had my eye on for a while, so, you know, I think I can veer and, you know, push it in that direction, and before you know it, um, you've got that. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is pretty parameterizable. Actually, you can make this uh, FizzBuzz calculator more par parameterizable. I mean, we've got all of the standard practices in there. We've got a setter. We've got, we've got setters for every getter. It's parameterizable. You can choose your Fizz and Buzz multiples. Uh, all kinds of, I mean, you know, this is... This is oh. So I am certainly of a particular... I'm a particular, uh, of a particular age and uh, inclination that even now, deep, deep into the 21st century, when somebody uses the word enterprise in relation to code, I cannot help but think of this, or the, the reboot, which is a beautifully elegant craft. Um, and strangely enough, this actually does have some kind of bearing on what we're interested in. The people, the habits that people have, there is a reality. Different people inhabit a different reality. When somebody comes up with FizzBuzz Calculator and they put all of that in, it's not because they're malicious or stupid. This doesn't generally happen. It turns out that most people in software development are really quite decent compared to a lot of professions. When people come up with this, what do they do? This is quite fun to write. People often say, uh, you know, occasionally I've done this when I've run workshops, and I say, well, you know, 
if I say, I want you to write some bad code, people find that very difficult. Yet they do it in their everyday jobs. So what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? I ha the, the, the penny dropped for me about three or four years ago at a client site when I looked at their code and I realized, and I basically recreated their style. I said, I want to use an example that's similar to yours. And I recreated their coding style with only about three or four assumptions. It turns out that what we often consider to be bad code is not arbitrary, it's not malicious, it's actually systematic. It follows a particular set of habits. And all you have to do is say, I am gonna program in this style. I will adopt these habits. And it turns out, before you know it, boom, there it is. You've just gone and recreate. And what is bewildering is how easy it is to do it that way. And you suddenly discover that all those people you've been cursing for all those years, yourself included, your past self, who was obviously stupid and malicious, actually, they were just being human. It turns out you, it's a system. And therefore, when you are thinking within a system, it's very natural to produce things. You can do it again and again. So we need to break that system. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of um, get back to this. What we've got, um, if you're interested, is that enterprise is actually the kind of the dub name of a, uh, a sort of a, well, it's not really a prototype, uh, but NASA are researching warp drive, and this is an artist's impression of what such a thing would look like. And yes, those big round things are actually warp coils. Um, it turns out that there is the possibility of warp drive. Uh, Miguel Alcubierre, a uh, Mexican uh, physicist in 1994, published a paper uh, based on um, general relativity, actually it drops out of the equations, that you can do a beautiful sleight of hand. You cannot move through space-time faster than the speed of light. That's your limit, that's your speed limit. But what if we moved space-time? That's brilliant. That's perfect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the reality and you can travel at whatever speed you like in space-time. You can now move space-time faster. There's a couple of minor implementation details, of course. Um, <laughs> it turns out that these coils will contain something known as exotic matter. We're not actually sure that stuff exists. We're not really sure. And one, by one estimate, the amount of exotic matter you'd need to compress into there would be approximately the mass of the moon. However, we'll figure those out in the later sprints. Um, <laughs> So what, why, why am I showing you this? Because I want to give you the sense that the enterprise is a re it comes with its own reality distortion field, okay? And that we need to break out of that. Um, so let's, let's go for, I'll, I'll do a groovy solution. Um, and so there's a fairly fundamental uh, approach to doing um, FizzBuzz. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's a reasonably procedural approach, uh, it uses um, uh, an accumulation uh, model, very, very simple. We accumulate into a result. This is one of the solutions that people come up with, and there's normally a, a moment of satisfaction when people realize they don't need a FizzBuzz case because you, it, it naturally falls out. However, there's a dissatisfaction that there's a kind of a the control flow and uh, yeah, accumulation. Maybe we'll want to have a, um, a mutually exclusive model which can be converted to functional uh, thinking more easily, at which point your colleague comes over and says, you're gonna, you're gonna do functional, are you? Oh, okay. Right, you do know that it, there's no statements, it's all expressions. And you go, yeah, but isn't this close enough? And your colleague goes, no, let me introduce you to the ternary operator. Um, and so there you go, that's, you know, they're, and, and, they, and they're proud of that. Okay, so maybe we stop there. But maybe we don't, because at the moment, all we've done is we've just shuffled the same idea around. We've just changed the shape of the control flow ever so slightly. Well, let's start thinking differently. At the moment, we're treating this as an arithmetic problem. Is it an arithmetic problem? Is there another way to look at it? Well, perhaps it's a set membership problem. Ah, huh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Let's think of it as a set membership. I've got a set of numbers that are multiples of 15. I've got a set of numbers that are multiples of three and of five. And if you are in this set, then that must be fizz buzz. If you are in this set, that must be fizz. If you're in this set, that must be buzz. Well, that's a different way of doing it. So there's no actual, strictly speaking, sort of arithmetic stuff going on there. We are. Um, we are simply counting through in steps of stuff, and we've created sets. And that kind of set logic is like, well, that, that feels different. It's a different shape. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about the performance here. Um, um, you know, if I've just presented you with something that travels faster than light, of course I'm not going to worry about performance. Um, so there is a notion here, okay, well, maybe I can do that. What about another approach? What about if I decide that I've got... I'm going to expand a range. Normally, this problem is defined up to 100. 
um, if you're wondering why the magic number uh, people define the cars are normally up to 100. Well, let's, let's mess about with the shape of the problem a little bit. And let's just say, well, look, just imagine all the fizzes. Well, what do you mean all the fizzes? Well, between 0 and 100, well, I've got a dummy for 0. Between 1 and 100, you go blank, blank, fizz, blank, blank, fizz, blank, blank, fizz. And then blank, 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 buzz, blank, 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 buzz. So you imagine you've got these two wheels turning. Let's just generate those. Okay, those are all the fuzzes you're going to, uh, fizzes, fizzes, fizz, fuzzes. I've just reduced the problem. Um, uh, those are all the fizzes you're going to need, all the buzzes you're going to need. And now what we're going to do is basically going to say, well, fizz buzz of n is now, I'll, thanks, I'll take from the fizzes. I'll concatenate that with the buzzes. And if there's something there, we're done. If there's nothing there, uh, we use Elvis to shift over to here. And we say, yeah, you know what, we'll take the numbers. And so therefore, what we've got is also the numbers. All the, here's all the numbers you're going to need from 1 to 100. It's just like, oh, that's kind of nice. Again, this looks really different. So this kind of thinking is, um, has a, a different feel to it. And then let's shift language again. Um, this is a version in um, uh, Orc, um, which is a kind of a, I, I still really like Orc, but that, that's just showing my age. People don't, Orc got trashed by Pearl one of the great injustices of our times. And um, Pearl has been roundly trashed by everything that's come since, so yay, revenge. Um, but what we've got here is something that is different. It is a different computational model. That's why I'm interested in all, because we're not sitting there going if. We're not ifing about anything. It's a text processing language. It is, um, it is effectively a rule-based language. You have code that is executed if it matches a particular um, uh, uh, regular expression or other guard expressions. So we're programming with guard clauses here. And we've got a very simple guard clause model, divisible by three, we'll have fuzz, uh, fizz, uh, divisible by five, buzz. Uh, if it's not divisible by either of these, we'll just have the number and we always throw in a new line. Now, how do we know that this works? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of generate one to 100, pop that in there, and then we're going to just we just test it against a file. Well, hang on, where's, where's all my TDD goodness gone? Well, it turns out that if you are, first of all, understand the shape and size of your problem. There are only 100 numbers. If, if we're caring about 100 numbers, then how, how big is that? Well, that's not very big. You can kind of put it in a file. Now, j just, as a quick, just as a quick reality check, given that we are distorting reality, what was FizzBuzz originally? It didn't originate in the software craftsmanship movement as a code carter. It's a drinking game, yes. Uh, although, funnily enough, if you go to Wikipedia's page on that, it has drinking game and it says citation needed. It's just like, really? You ask my friends. You know, it was known as a drinking game. Um, it is, it is, uh, and it is a drinking game, because really the whole idea is you sit around, you go one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz. The minute you take a drink, the minute you've had a little bit of alcohol, then all those beautiful logical faculties that you've developed over decades just kind of wash away. And um, I have played this sober with my wife and my two boys while we were waiting for a meal one day. And they hadn't delivered the wine by this point. So you've got, you've got, you've got mathematically nerdy 10-year-old, totally mathematically competent 14-year-old, and two adults who are really gasping for wine. It is the most boring game in history. So w let us just say that we generated this sample file, and then boom, OK, we've got the template. This is, this is a, a, our golden record here. However, there is a point I want to make. Let's talk about TDD. Um, Alfred Aho, who is the A in Orc, Aho Weinberger Kernigan, he, um, he was interviewed a few years ago about uh, his work on Orc. And this is the 1970s. I want you to sort of put that in context. And, after a particular incident, um, he said, OK, we decided, to put in a, um, we decided to put in some tests. We instituted a rigorous regression test for all of the features of Orc. Any of the three of us who put in a new feature into the language first had to write a test for the new feature. So this is kind of like the prehistory. You know, this is 1970s style. Because the great thing is, at that point, you're guaranteed you've got decent coverage. In fact, the whole point of TDD is you always have more coverage than you have code. Uh, you know, that, that's a very simple way of doing that. But now we're actually sure. So there's a nice prehistory here. Now, that gets us talking about the mechanism and the misunderstandings. So is normally, the narrative is normally red, green, refactor. OK, 
I'm not entirely comfortable with this way of thinking about it, although there is, it's, not, it's not false. It's not necessarily inspiring. It's not necessarily educational. You tell somebody, you're going to write a failing test first of all. It's just like, Shh, yeah, I can do that. Hell, you want me to write code that doesn't compile? Absolutely. You know, I have no problem with that. You know, this is not a challenge. Yeah? So uh, it's not inspiring, although it is accurate, it is not inspiring. Problem is we end up with stuff that gets dumbed down. And I do this, you know, when I've got, when I've got people to move away from just doing stuff in green um, in workshops and on training courses, one of the biggest problems is red green. Is once they go, yeah, I'm gonna do it, we're gonna do it, we're gonna failing test, make it pass, failing test, make it pass, failing test, make it pass. And it's just like, yeah, but your solution sucks. Oh, well, TDD sucks, man. Your TDD made me do this. No, 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 really it didn't. You're supposed to bring your brain to the party. Now the problem is, you know, these are, these are guardrails at best, but there are a lot of misunderstandings. The problem is they're fostered by a number of other misunderstandings. There's a, uh, uh, Uncle Bob has these three laws of TDD, which are not entirely correct, which is uh, not unusual for him. Um, uh, you are not allowed to write any production code unless it is to make a failing unit test pass. Okay. You are not allowed to write any more of a unit test than is sufficient to fail. You're not allowed to write any more production code than is sufficient to pass the one failing unit test. If that's your legal system, you're missing the bit where you say, oh, don't forget code quality, all the other stuff. Because otherwise you're going to follow this through and you're going to follow it blindly. So let's just go do this one straight in Python. I'm going to assert fizzbuzz of one is one. Great. There you go. Brilliant. And two. Yeah. Yeah, we can do this all day. <laughs> yeah. You, that's the problem. We've just, du we've just followed the laws. We've just followed that dumbed down version of the cycle. Uh, I'm just going to round it off just for sort of satisfactory completeness. I was like, yeah. Then your colleague comes over and says, really? Ah, come on, man. You've got to do this. You need a more declarative approach. Ah, yeah. <laughs> cool. I've got a lookup table with lambdas. Get me. Your functional code is nowhere near as good as this functional code. You've got one or two lambdas? I've got a hundred. Yeah? And I've got the lookup table approach. God damn it. Yeah. Okay. And then you, that, that moment of disappointment when you realize it's just a lookup table and actually you didn't need all of those indexes because actually you can do it all. Well, this is kind of dull. Um, however, uh, uh, maybe we could just copy and paste it from the test file. Oh, yeah, that's a, oh, no, no, do not copy the results to and fro between the tests like that. That's, we haven't learnt anything here. Or rather, what we have learnt is that that last bit is really important. But let's reframe this. Let's reframe this. My favourite reframing of this is to realise that it's an example of the deming art cycle. Plan, do, study, act. Feel free to call that check, but uh, Schuart's original formulation was study, and I think in this particular case, it gets study sounds slow, and I want it to sound slow. Check sounds cursory and casual. You need to slow down. And the, importantly, the nice thing about this is there is a visibility boundary. The visibility boundary, in fact, for those of you sitting at the back, the visibility boundary is really obvious. It's the top half, and the bit that's invisible is the bottom half. Now, why is that important? Because it turns out that the thing that you see, I can see planning, I can see doing, but studying and acting, these are very soft, very intangible, and yet that's where the magic happens, whether, or whatever scale we're looking at. Because we often see, uh, we see this uh, with organizations, you know, um, what, is, what does waterfall look like? Waterfall looks like plan, 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 do, 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 okay? So, okay, maybe we're gonna do some sprints and we're going to get into agile development, but it doesn't turn out to be agile. It just turns out to be iterative and incremental. So we break it down, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do. That's brilliant. We've broken it down. We've amortized certain costs, but any learning is getting sidelined. It's not being made explicit. If you want to be agile, then that's the bit you need. It's just like, whoa, slow down a bit. Pause. Let's have a look at this. Let's reflect on this. In other words, this is empirical. When people talk about empirical processes, this is what we mean. You are supposed to try stuff, uh, experiment with stuff, get the feedback. So that takes us right back to the idea that one side of a carter is not simply, I'm going to get good at doing this, is to allow you the opportunity to experiment with new things in a safe context. And that's a really key idea. Let's, let's just try different ideas. So we can take that and we can actually re-render it if you feel you want to write it as the four R's. Write, reify, reflect, refactor. 
That is a focus on the activity rather than the events. I'm going to write a test case for something that does not yet exist. A consequence of that will be read. You know, it won't pass. But I'm not interested in the fact that it's read. I'm interested that I'm trying to frame how I'm going to use this. Now I'm going to make it real. I'm going to reify it. I'm going to pull this one out. It's, a pull, it's basically a pull-driven approach. I'm going to pull this one out. I'm going to respond with code. I'm going to make it real. And then I'm going to reflect and refactor as necessary. More Star Trek references. So there is this idea that I've got a much more, I guess, more intelligent. I'm not focusing on the events, the reds and the greens, and the activities refactor in the same way. I'm trying to give it a much richer context. So let's try a different way of testing it. I'm going to go back to Python. What I'm going to do is I'm going to generate all the results that I need. I'm going to go for the actual results because it's, it's only 100, so let's, let's go for that. So I've now got a list with all the fizz buzzes, one, two, fizz, four, and so on. Now what I'm going to do is I want to make a, a statement of truths. I'm going to try a different approach. Rather than saying, hey, this looks like this, or here's the examples, I'm going to try a different. There are a number of true statements that I can make about that range of stuff, those 100 results. And I'm going to assert that they're all true. Basically, every result is fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz, or a decimal string. This is a truth. Every decimal result corresponds to its ordinal position. Okay, so if I've got, the, if I've got um, 11, then that should be in corresponding position 11. Every third result contains fizz. Every fifth result contains buzz. Every 15th result is fizz buzz. And then we need to mop up to get all the constraints. The ordinal position of every fizz result is divisible by 3, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason I did this in Python is because it turns out it's surprisingly easy to translate that. Um, Python's everybody's favorite pseudocode. If you want to go and do this in Java, feel free, but change the font size. Um, <laughs> now, what we've got here is a warm-up to what, um, uh, you know, if you continue along this road, you end up with property-based testing. Um, but it turns out that, uh, that what we've done is we've just started off with a very s a simple set of logical propositions that this is actually a better way of perhaps testing it. But it does also show you that trying to be logical is surprisingly hard. Um, and you know, th we can tell this from personal experience. Okay, so where else can we take this? Well, we can observe that if we look at this, there is a simple encoding. There's a different way of doing this, that we either end up with the number, let's call that zero, or we end up with fizz, let's call that one, or buzz, let's call that two, or fizz buzz, let's call that three. And it's a repeating cycle with a period of 15. Let's just shift everything by one to make the indexing work nicely. And let's throw some Ruby code around it. Um, so now what we've got is a different way of looking at this, again. That's kind of interesting that there's a sequence of 15. I wonder, well, if you ever have that conversation with somebody where they say, you know, oh, random numbers, you know, they're random enough. Just show them this. Um, I found this one uh, uh, on the internet. I do collect FizzBuzz solutions, by the way. Um, I, I, I collect failure photographs and FizzBuzz solutions. This one's absolutely brilliant because it turns out that the standard Unix RAND implementation uh, if you seed it at this number, has that repeating cycle. Brilliant. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. So you have all it, yeah. So this is the whole thing. In software, we work with illusions. We work with smoke and mirrors. We work with illusions to maintain a view of stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to show you random stuff is not really random. But what about infinity? It's one of my favorite solutions. Originally um, comes from uh, uh, Dirk Koenig. Um, in, uh, uh, in Frager, uh, JVM Haskell. And I adapted that solution, and then I translated it into Clojure. Um, and it's a, it's a very elegant way of thinking about it. What we're going to do is we're going to actually, we're going to say, you know what, we're going to stare into infinity, and we're going to have a solution here. Um, we're going to have all the physics, not just the few that I had for the Python solution, up to 100. No, I'm going to have all of this. So there's an infinite number of physics there. Blank, blank, fizz, blank, blank, fizz, all the way to infinity. Now I'm going to have all the buzzes, same treatment. Blank, 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 buzz. Blank, 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 buzz, and so on to infinity. Now I'm going to combine all of these. I'm going to ask me all the words, all the fizzes, all the buzzes, and all the fizz buzzes that you're ever going to need. And then I'm going to have all the numbers, one, two, three, four, in string form. So at the moment, you are looking at four infinities. Okay, Good job you're sitting. You could get dizzy. 
Okay, and you're thinking, well, actually, you know what? My latest laptop's got like quite a few gig, but not probably quite enough to contain this. And we're going to have all the fizz buzzes we ever need, five infinities. So we can put this into context. We can say, well, here's the fizzes. Let's cycle this forever. But here's the buzzes. Let's take that sequence and cycle it forever. So this is a sort of a wonderful example of one of the sort of the elegant sides of functional programming is functional programming is not based on doing stuff. It's based on promising stuff. It's just like, yeah, this is how it would look if, you were, if I were to give you an infinite number. It would look like this. Are you giving it to me? Absolutely not. Yeah. Here's, here's the same for buzzes. I'm going to describe how I would do words. Are you giving me all of those words? No, I'm just describing how I might give it to you. Yeah? If people say functional programming is very mathematical, yeah, so true. Mathematicians, it's like, yeah, it's trivial to show that. Yeah? Give me some detail here. Mm, no. Um, here's all the numbers. And then here's all the fizz buzzes. So at the moment, what we've got, if you like, people often talk about imperative programming as being kind of like the anchor for procedural and many other paradigms. Imperative. Imperative, we have the idea of an imperative voice in uh, grammar. So there's the idea of commands, doing stuff. So what does that make, um, what does that make functional programming? Functional programming, in this sense, is uh, subjunctive programming. If I were to give you fizz buzzes, it would look like this. Are you giving those to me? Absolutely not. It would take more resources than we have in the universe. But there's an imperative statement right at the end. Take 100. At this point, something actually happens. Okay? At that point, we make a commitment. So this is sort of an elegant side to this. What's great is there's no functions. We've defined no functions here. This is all data structuring in infinite streams. Very different style of solution, which does also give us the William Morgan quote, which I think is rather elegant. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'm going to sort of wrap up. Well, I, I, I'm gonna, I do want to sneak in one more little carter and just sort of mess about with it, but we're going to kind of blitz through the slides kind of quickly. Um, one of the things I, I, I quite enjoy, and I've still got to come up with tomorrow, is, is uh, I, I like words, I, I like language, I, and um, I also like taking photographs of books. Uh, it's, it's a hobby. Um, and on Facebook, I run a page, Word Friday. Every Friday, I put up an unusual word in its definition, and I kind of link to it from Twitter. Uh, the rest of the week, I put other linguistic stuff. But if you can manage to somehow just drop into a conversation some of these words, and I know somebody who does do that, they take my Word Friday, and they see if they can actually use it at the weekend. So hats off to you if you can use biquinary coded decimal. You know, just casually slip that one into a conversation with the family. Just see how that one works out. Uh, system of representing numbers based on counting in fives. I have no idea where that came from. Um, and we normally distinguish the range, the upper part of the range or the lower part. Zero to four or one to five, um, and then five to nine uh, or six to ten. Uh, we see it on traditional abacus models, but we also see it in the Roman numeral system. Yes, it's that Carter. It's time for that. So let's do this enterprisey style. Right, here we go. Oh, font change. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. If you are being paid by the line of code, this is magnificent, and you can leave now. But you can look at that and go, oh, there's repetition. There's repetition. I've, what I've got, while loop, if, 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 while loop, if, if, if. What is an if? An if is a while loop that executes at most once. Ah, oh, OK, brilliant. So let's just change that. Let's create a table. Let's do the lookup approach. Now, what is interesting here is we see that classic old adage. If I show you my data structures, you can figure out what the program does. The previous one was all logistics and mechanics and control flow management. Here, I can just show you that. And you go, oh, you're doing Roman numerals. OK, it's really obvious at this point. And we've got a nice separation. Can we do a little bit more than this? It's still feeling a bit procedural. Well, this is groovy, so yeah. OK, let's, let's now, whoa, I've just injected stuff. This is the drug-fueled side of programming. We don't talk about passing things. We talk about injecting them these days. <laughs> you know? When I started in programming, I know, yeah, one of the, uh, once upon a time, I was a Fortran programmer. We merely passed arguments. Okay, how boring is that? Now we inject <laughs> dependencies. Damn, you know, it's just like, whoa, that's a high. So now we're doing this. We are injecting code into tables. Bam, this is just, I'm getting high just thinking about it. Now, can we can do this even further? We can take this and really we, we actually have an inject. Fantastic. So now what we've actually got is I've taken away all the declared variables. I've declared, taken away all the side effects. I've now created a pipeline. 
I've now got a pipeline, and each station is a number, and now I'm going to throw the code down it. Hmm, that's kind of elegant. But we can take that further. Um, John Jagger uh, came to my house a, a couple of years back, and we were just messing about with some code. He said, oh, I came across a really different solution to the Roman numerals Carter um, recently. And uh, so we read through the blog. It was done in F-sharp. Uh, John um, felt more comfortable with Ruby, so we did it in Ruby. And then I put it into a proper programming language afterwards. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, here I'm going to re-render it in, uh, in Groovy. Um, and it's, it's an elegant approach. What we're going to do is we're going to say, no, 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 forget biquinary. Forget binary. Let's use unary. Unary is the fundamental counting uh, uh, model of the universe. Okay? If you've got one planet, it's one planet. Two planets is two planets. Three planets is three planets. There's none of this kind of stupid positional notation. So in other words, uh, I, 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 it keeps on going. So we're going to convert to unary. Then we're going to replace five I's with V. We're going to replace remaining four I's with IV. Replace double V's with X. Ooh, this is kind of neat. It's like, whoa! In other words, it turns out it's actually not an arithmetic problem at all. We've been approaching it as an arithmetic problem. It's a symbolic problem. And it's just like, I had never looked at it like that. And John showed me another variation the other week. He, he, he started experimenting with that. You can do all kinds of stuff with this. And it's just like, oh. And then you're sitting there going like, yeah, but I've got to do Java. No, no problem. Done. OK, so you know, th this is it. And you're thinking, yeah, but what would this look like if we were doing this in a real functional programming language? It's like, OK, let's go to Clojure. <laughs> we might need to rearrange the font size there. Um, it's October. It is autumn. The geese are migrating. Here they are. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bit of a problem here, because it turns out that the standard function application model really doesn't work. It lacks any kind of visual honesty and coherence. And then you get people going like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, you get used to this as functional programming. No, I don't want to get used to that. I like reading, OK? I, I, you know, I have a whole reading model that I spent years developing. It's just like, OK, well, let's, do, let's take a composition approach. Get me my lambdas. Oh, brilliant. So here's my, here's my lambdas. Um, and so we've got that. But the composition approach is still back to front. It still reads bottom to top. And this is a kind of a problem, because some functional code reads top to bottom. Some of it looks, reads bottom to top. So you've got to decide on entry to a function which way you're going to read it. And it's just like, you know what? I'm not really keen on this. But let's get rid of some of the noise. Yeah, but still, it's becoming more tabular. But it turns out we can recover our vis visual honesty with a couple of tricks. Threading. It's like, oh, OK, this is really quite nice. And so we've got a different way of looking at it. And it allows us to kick the tires of the language, mess about with things. Now, you might say, well, this is just games of notations. Yeah, of course it is. Um, Richard Feynman observed that ultimately everything comes down to this question of notation. The history of mathematics is the history of better notation. And I would contend that much the same is true for software development. It's just a simple way of framing an idea, finding the word, the right word, the right expression. And sometimes it's easier than at other times. But that's what you're doing. You're searching for things. And you're trying out crazy ideas. Because when I realized that it was no longer a mathematical problem, and I, I converted it to a few other languages, in one of those idle thoughts, I thought, you know what? Yeah, you can do this. You can do this just using shell script. Uh. And it's just like, yeah, actually, just straight bash. And it's just like we have a solution. So we're kind of out of time. But we know that style is times full. We know that form is times student, having gone through this process of really trying to understand that we're not merely repeating something to get better at the thing itself. If the thing that we are trying to do is get better at programming, developing code, creating software, then that involves thought. We need to get better at thinking. We need to as de deliberately bank up our reserves of habits, but also keep that little bit of creativity to one side. It's a balance of the two. You need to be able to experiment and feel free to do so. And a Carter is also an opportunity for that. Thank you very much. Right, um, questions in the break. Uh, and at the end, because I'm on the panel at the end of the day, uh, and, I'm, and I'm around if you want to sort of, you know, harangue me with other FizzBuzz solutions. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so we've got time for.